Hey, this is Henry Sanders back with another episode of Real Talk. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for everything you're doing. Sincerely, thank you for committing uh, to this 365 state of mind and making sure we let all our influencers be heard. Uh, if you want more of this content, make sure you go to our podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. Go to our YouTube channel if you're interested more in the video. So today I have uh, someone I met, had to be, I don't know, I'm showing my age here. Maybe it's like three years ago, maybe, maybe a little longer. Three or four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this brother uh, is talented as an author, as a business owner. Uh, who's someone who is well known. If you, if you haven't read his books, you should read his books. He has, uh, Winter in America. He has another one that's coming out soon. Uh, this brother is talented. I met him when he was working at Oshkosh Corp. Right? Is that the Oshkosh right. Corp mm -hmm. yep. in, in Wisconsin? The brother's now in Atlanta doing big, big things. Uh, he's going to be part of our men's leadership summit also coming up. And this brother is just, um, I'm excited to have him because the wealth of knowledge. Any of you who are interested in DNI work, any of you interested in how to be an author or business, this is this is the show for you. We have an expert, a national expert coming in who can give you some tips. Uh so my man, Shelton Good, brother, how are you doing? Hey, Henry, how you doing, man? It's been a, it's been a while, but you know, I've been admire. I, I'm glad to see uh how you transitioned uh from your uh Obama appointed post and got Madison 365. I remember when he's just just getting this thing off the ground. So I'm glad to I'm follow you on all the social media. So thanks for letting me be a part of the uh, today's show and the upcoming panel. Everybody, make sure you check out the uh, the upcoming panel. It's going to be a blast. Yeah. So again, thank you for that. And our, we do have a men's leadership summit coming up. What he's talking about, and we decided to do that because there's so many conversations going on in america right now but you, you almost never hear the conversation around men of color yeah and and how men of color need to how the challenges that men of color have or the challenge they have to thrive or what they're doing to thrive what how they're doing to succeed and so uh hope you guys all please check out our, our men leadership summit coming up next april 14th and 15th but bro let's, let's get to you okay. so okay so this I, cause I'm, I'm interested i don't know your whole story either right so i'm curious to know your story so this is what i know about you this this I know one that you're a go getter. I remember that you were going to Oshkosh, flying back and forth through Atlanta. Right. Osh Oshkosh Court brought you in because they really want to do some DNI work. You were the first person they brought in to do that DNI. So you basically right. built it from scratch. Right. Right. Uh I know that then you left and went to Atlanta. And I knew you were an author before when you were at Oshkosh, you right. were you were an author and you had a book called Beyond Inclusion. Is that what the name of it was? Well, at that at that point I had just published Crisis as a platform for change. And at that point we were all lamenting and um you know about the deaths of uh, trayvon and um and michael brown and and others and i had i had a lot of pent up thoughts and and needed a way to, to get those on paper and and to help people understand um to become a, a little bit more empathetic and see the world through the eyes of of uh african-american males um and understand that we weren't just um making things up Mm -hmm. And and so obviously we know June 2020 with uh, with the death of George, people saw that video and no one could deny. Finally, people could say, I'm seeing it with my own two eyes. And, yeah. and as a result of that, we have some people now that are a little bit more enlightened. But even before that, I was trying to enlighten people considering that we had um, between 2014 in 2015, in a 12-month period, we had over 100 um, black men that were um, killed at the uh, at the hands of law enforcement, either during an arrest or while incarceration. And while Wait, a say, lot of say, say, stay, 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 say that again. I want you to say those numbers again for our people. 112, 112 unarmed, unarmed black men that were either um, that were killed either as a result of a, an arrest, a stop. Or a uh, you know, or being temporarily incarcerated, awaiting trial, and and everybody knew about the big names. Everybody knew about the big names, but there were a lot of um, incidents, and and so that became something personally um, important to me. And I wrote about it, and that's where that's the book you're referencing. Yeah. And 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 by the way, I never would have thought when I wrote Christ as a platform for change 
that we would have had uh, uh, the, the, the murders of um, Brianna and George and the mod and here in Atlanta, Mr. Blake and on and on and on. I would have never imagined that would have happened. So, yeah, you're almost prophetic in a lot of ways. So let's take us back to your beginning of your journey, because you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm curious about how you became this wonderful, brilliant man that you are so, now. No. Like, how did how did that happen? Like, so where are you? Where are you from originally? Philly, born and raised in Philadelphia. Uh, oh, Philly. Okay. Yes, I'm skinny kid from North Philly. Um, you know, a uh, product of a two parent household. One parent believed religion was the was the only path to a forward and advancement. The other parent believed it was education. Between the two of them, I went to a parochial school, uh, went to a parochial charter school, went to a parochial, uh, you know, college prep. Uh, school taught by Jesuits, so it was that blending of, hey, you know, the, the Lord, you know, has got a plan for us, and but you got to have some education so you can be smart enough to follow his plan. And uh, they, and then those times when I wanted to be a knucklehead and go my own way, nah, my folks wasn't having it. <laughs> 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 so the, the person that's here today, uh, you know, I survived the, 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 the streets of Philly in the 70s, and um and, you know, thanks to some parents and then um, went into the Air Force, served the country for, oh. o- for over 20 years. Um, proud to have done that. Even more proud of the fact that my sons have followed me. I've got both two sons, one in the Navy, one in the Air Force. And by the way, they made their own decision. They informed me after after the fact. So I'm, I'm really proud. I'm really proud of, of that. Um, and so then that gave me a strong foundation on which to build on after leaving military service. You know, it's interesting to tell about your parents. Uh, so my parents were the same way. It's, so my mom is straight Baptist, hallelujah, love Jesus, love God and the yeah. church. My yeah. dad's my dad's an attorney. He's agnostic. He's from the perspective of, hey, if there's a God, why are black people getting lynched and killed? Yeah. He's from he's from down south of Mississippi, right? And, yeah. Uh, and so he has a different perspective. So I can relate to what you're saying, and I can also relate to what you said, what you didn't say. But I heard I heard some whoopings in there. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. <laughs> they, they would call, they would call that. Uh, they would have a criminal statute. Your father being an attorney would know. Yeah, some of that punishment may have borderline on, uh, may have bordered on, uh, you know, assault. But yeah, but I my knucklehead, I needed it. You know, in Philly, thinking I knew everything. Yeah. You know, um, not not given appreciation uh, uh, to, for for what God had was doing for me in my life, and not respecting my parents for making the sacrifices to to to, to put to to pay for a very expensive education. And considering the fact I had two sisters and a brother, you know, um, as well, but that found th- that foundation allowed me to have a successful career in the Air Force. The Air Force didn't have to shape me or mold me or brainwash me. They just had to polish me off a little bit and say, "Hey, this is how you're going to do things this way." But the combination of those two gave me the foundation so that when I decided to go into uh, leave military life, military service. And then coming to corporate America, I was I was ready. I was ready. What what did the Air Force and military do to help you get ready for corporate work? That's a jump, right? I mean, they come yeah. from all that structure and Air yeah. Force, and yeah. you know, yes, you they know you know where you're going to be and all that stuff. Yeah. Lots of still yeah. military. I, I was never been in the military, but I know it's structured. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you take from the military, and then you go to corporate America. Yeah. What did what did the Air Force help you do to make that transition? I give you I give you four things. Number one, um, it threw you in instantly and you had to accomplish, you had to do things and you had to accomplish results um, with a, a, I don't want to, I hate to say it, with a diverse group of people. And I'm talking about diverse in every, I had never heard of Rome, Georgia, but I can <laughs> remember um, being in with, and one of my friends that I developed a friendship with was from Rome, Georgia. And, and you just had to deal with different people. I can remember a skinny white kid uh, that was from Wheeling, West Virginia. I couldn't even point out West Virginia on a map. You, know, you see what I'm saying? But you have to learn to not only, I'm not talking about tolerate. I'm not talking about tolerate. I'm not talking about integrate. I'm talking about function and in order to achieve the results that were you were expected to receive. That's number one. 
Number two, discipline and self-control. You couldn't just do whatever you wanted to do whenever you wanted to do it because you want to do it. You had to find a way to be you. I think about it like being a, a part of the temptations, right? You know, you, just, <laughs> you know, Eddie Kendrick, David, you know, everybody got to play their role or maybe on the sports team. You just can't get out there and come down the court and shoot every time. You, you got to function within a, a concept, within a and, and there was plenty of room. The brother found enough room to be me and be Air Force. They, they you know, wasn't, I think people have a misperception about the, the Air Force. There's plenty of room, plenty of room to be you. The, the other thing, um, like I, like I uh, you know, in addition to those two skills, leadership, leadership. And, and uh, by the way, everybody was expected to be a leader regardless of your rank. At some mm-hmm. point and at some time, even if you, even if, even if you're, even if someone else outranked you, if you had a particular subject matter expertise, everybody deferred to you to step up and like, wait a minute, you, you know, I went to Saudi Arabia and, uh, you know, picked up the language a little bit and, and had studied the culture much more so than any of my fellow um, people that work with me at the embassy, military people, not talking about state department, but before I went, I, I, I made sure I, I, I did everything I could. So when I went over there, so people, so even though there, there were people that outranked me when I was in Saudi, they deferred to me because I understood the culture. So people expect you to lead if you have the the the, the subject matter expertise. You just have to have the confidence. You have to have the comfort, the confidence, and the competence to step up when it's your turn to step up. And last but not least, communication. You have to. One minute you're talking to a four-star general. Or the or the, the 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 head of the embassy, an ambassador. The next minute, you're talking to uh, an airman, and you have to be able to communicate not based on how you want to communicate, but how how they wanted you to communicate to them, so they can understand your message. Those skills transferred instantly. The day I took off the uniform, the day I put on the suit, I had those four skills, and I had them honed. To 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 a, to a fine point, and so much so that it stood out right away. That's, a, that's amazing to me that you even that you could distill all that and break it down to those four things. And what I actually think, and and, and it makes so much sense from a DNI lens too, what you just uh-huh. said. Uh-huh. Uh, but what also what's really stuck out to me is what you said is uh, about having diversity and uh-huh. not just inclusion. But a functioning uh-huh. organization like where uh-huh. I, I, we're not just bringing people of color, or people different different backgrounds from uh-huh. Rome, Georgia, but all uh-huh. this stuff. But you have to be functioning. Like I want to bring people uh-huh. together to actually function and uh-huh. flourish. That's like a level that most people in DNI don't ever talk about. We talk about diversity, inclusion. We're yeah. talking about representation. Yeah. We talk about tolerate, tolerate all that stuff. Yeah. You're actually talking about a different level of functioning yeah. to make sure that the military flourishes. And you, you talked about sports too, and I, I love it because I always use sports when I'm talking to people because of DNI. I think the military uh-huh. is the same thing, right? It's like you, we, the, the sports are in, especially football and basketball, they do this uh-huh. well. They want to get W's. Right. Absolutely. They want to they win. Absolutely. Bottom line. Absolutely. And to do that, they know they have to have diversity. And they don't care if you're white, black, Asian, Native American, whatever it is. Right. If you can help me get this W. Right. Right. Come, come in. Right. We, ha- we have a game plan. We have a structure. But we, we right. need you to help us function to flourish yeah. so we can get these W's. Right. Get the line. And right. I hear you saying the same thing about the military. And so I, yep. I, I, I think that's well, powerful. Well, I, but I talk to CEOs. I talk to chairmen of, of boards every day. And I try to – I say, so forget all those fancy words. Forget the – maybe you don't – Henry, if you ask 10 people to give you a definition of diversity, you're going to get 50 different answers. Yeah. The same way with equity, the same way in inclusion. I get rid of those words. And I just say, okay, um, you know, I'm a huge football fan, huge mm-hmm. football fan. I says, let's just take a team, any team. You've got, you've got different people on the team with different skills, and you want them to pl- use those skills, and you label them with positions, lineman, quarterback. The lineman ain't trying to be the quarterback. The quarterback ain't trying to. Everybody's got to play your position. Why? You got to respect the person to your left and to your right. You got to count on them to do their job, which helps you do your job. If they do their job, it helps you do your job better. And, 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 and what I try to get them to do, if you got somebody on the bench 
with a uniform on, with a number and a name, but they don't feel like they're part of the team. That's your job to say, whoa, what's up? You know, yeah, you, uh, maybe you haven't gotten many minutes, but you still are part of this team. Be ready to step up when the next man goes down. Mm-hmm. Be ready. When I call your number and put you in the game, you practice, you show up, you know the place. Pete, that's respect. That's going to people. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with you taking a manager, taking time to say, I know you're a little frustrated, not getting the playing time you want, whatever. And that's what people have gotten so inundated with make it trying to, they've gotten totally confused. I try to make things simple for mm-hmm. folks. And those clients that we have at Icarus Consulting, that's what we do. We try to help them understand you want W's. So let's talk about how you get W's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, if you don't want to get W's, then you don't need me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you don't need me to tell you how to lose. You, you know, <laughs> hey, so so just keep doing what you're doing. But if you want to win, and, and we have to describe for them what winning looks like. Yes. Yeah. So what, winning, does, win, what, what does winning look like? You, you know what? It, it, um, there is no one definition of winning. For each team, for some, t- if you went two and twelve one year, wouldn't next year wouldn't uh, seven and seven look pretty good oh, for yeah. the next year? Mm-hmm. I'm just saying for the next year. If you were, if you had two and twelve, and you went to seven, and then for the next year, wouldn't ten and two look pretty good? Or yeah, I guess or, or twelve and two. You see, what I'm saying winning is is has to be defined by each organization at each snapshot in time. Come on, man, we're coming back from COVID. Winning looks different for a company that almost that almost that had to um, lay off fifty percent of its workforce and was one payroll away from bankruptcy. Winning in in April of twenty one looks different than it did in November of twenty twenty. It certainly does. So when you're talking to your your clients and you you've made this shift to Air Force to corporate America and. Now, D and I, that, like it's the hot thing, right? It's the hot thing right. everyone's talking about. And, you know, mm-hmm. every, everyone's off the shelf of doing D and I experts, etc. Right. You've been you've been in this game for a while. So, what do you explain to people who who, who are in this D and I space? I love what you how you explain what you learned, but how did you implement that into into the corporate America and to make sure that your clients got those W's right? Because you as you know, just like I know, a lot of DNI stuff shows evidence shows that it doesn't really move the needle right. unless you're doing some key things. Right. And, and you've named four of them. Like like yeah. so yeah. what what do you do and explain to your clients to make this like a W for them? So the first thing I do is is is, is have that conversation for where we are right now today. What does what would winning look like? What is it that you want to accomplish in the next 12 months? Maybe the next 24 months, maybe the next three years. And then I don't go further than that. I don't go further. It's like, OK, let's let's look at what what sustainable success looks like. And, and then they say, so can I give you a real world example? Um, one of my clients was was Papa John's and Papa John's had found themselves, you know, losing market share for a lot of reasons. I'm not, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but I talked to the CEO and I says, help me understand what success looks like. He says, based on where we are right now, considering the firestorm of backlash we're getting based on, you know, some, some things that the previous CEO and, and board members said and did, here's what it looks like. I need you, number one, my, I'm losing market share. And a lot of that market share is, is, is blacks who are consuming our pizza. He says, I need you to help me keep the customers, the black customers in particular, people of color, help me keep the ones that I got. I don't want to lose anymore. Help me. Number two, help me be able to get some of the ones that I lost back. I'm willing to do, you know, I'm willing, I'm, 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 list, I'm willing to consider almost anything. Help me get those customers back. Number three, help me get the customers. We have, we have a heck of a pizza. Help me get the new customers. Can you help me do that? I says, I, I definitely can help you do that. And Icarus in partnership with uh, Nimbus, a multi uh, headed up by Don and Stacy Wade um, out of uh, Louisville, a multicultural uh, marketing firm, um, uh, were instrumental in helping them um, turn things around. We were instrumental in, in getting Shaquille O'Neal to the table. And now he's a, a member of the, the board. Not only that, he's an owner of multiple franchises. One of them is right here in Atlanta. And, you know, just his commercials alone um, in the beginning 
um, people are like, whoa, Shaq is rolling with them. And people that know Shaq, know Shaq don't roll with everybody. He does, you have to do, you have to know Shaq as the businessman. He is very discriminating about the products and the businesses he works with. And that was instrumental. But but and then the company did a lot of training. It had to, it got rid of it, it changed some leaders out, got some different leadership in. And 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 so that's a turnaround. That's what it looked like for them. You understand what I'm saying? It, and, and, and sure, they 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 want to do some things, uh, you know, you know, they want to increase the diversity of their board and 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 get more uh, women and people of color and leadership and and think they want to do some of those other things too. But at the end, but none of that is is not going to move the big needle, which is selling pizzas. He's so so that when the president tells me right there in Atlanta, I've had drivers who feel unsafe delivering pizzas, particularly in um, black neighborhoods. He says, I can't have that. And these are black drivers feeling safe going into black neighborhoods simply because they got the big pizza, the Papa John's sign. So, so that's, so we work with companies just like that. Let's crystallize what winning looks like for you today. Now, now they've, uh, the company is um, now back in, um, back in the green or back in the black. I'm sure that success in the next W looks different. It probably means taking over the number one spot from Pizza Hut. You know, I, I'm I'm just saying it's not a one size fits all. If that makes any sense, Henry. It does. I, I'm I, I I love what you said too. Just how you dropped it, like Papa John's, Shaquille O'Neal. Like you know, you dropped out humbly. Like you know, these are big names that you're working with. So that's that's impressive that you're doing that, brother. I want to just I, sometimes we don't stop and appreciate and be grateful for what our black folks are doing, our leaders of color are doing. Yeah, and yeah, so so yeah. I just want I want you to know that that alone is impressive that you work with Papa John's. You can even have any associates with Shaquille O'Neal. That is to be appreciated, brother. That's black excellence in my my perspective. Yeah. So and so and, 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 and 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 black excellence that's recognized by the people who recognize excellence, period. You um when Forbes became aware of what happened with Papa John's. They interviewed me to be, you know, whether or not you're going to be a DNI trailblazer. And I gave them the specifics. They asked tough questions. You know, how do you know it was a direct result of your input and, you know, whatever, and then blah, blah, blah. And, and they said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you, if you can say DNI is making cultural and business sustainable change, oh, yeah, you, you, that's how you become... Uh, 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 one of the top 10 DNI firms in that short period of time that we've been in existence. So it's not, I got a great team. They do hard work, but we also earn the trust of people who have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. They have a, a, a another responsibility to both their employees and customers. I tell you what my new thing is now, it's trying to get those same companies to spend more with small businesses that are owned by women, people of color, LGBTQ, uh, plus vets, and to get them to focus internally on some of their practices that may be getting in their own way. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies that say, oh, we don't want to do, you know, we want everybody to come back to work. I'm saying, really? Why don't you, let's talk about that. So, so um, again, you know, black excellence, your sponsors recognize it, you know, Glad that they've given you a, a platform so we can have this kind of straight talk, real talk, um, unfiltered conversation. So excellence, excellence is always going to be recognized. So, OK, you've said so much. I mean, I hope people appreciate what you're saying. Look, he he's saying he has he, he went to the Air Force. He learned these skills, leadership, discipline, accountability, how to function as a real inclusive organization. He took that to the, to the private sector. He worked with Papa John's. Papa John's had some issues. And then he addressed like what they was interesting, what they were really like re retention. Like we want to retain what we have for people of color. Then we want to reach out and like, expand our base, expand our universe. And you helped all that stuff. And you actually connected us. A celebrity that connected to black folks uh, and helping bring them in. So it's one thing. This is one of my pet peeves with like ad, ad agencies and stuff when they try to do media buys to try to reach people of color and they go to like organizations that don't have credibility with people of color. They, they, just because you reach people of color, I mean you have credibility with people of color. So what I love what you did was you were astute enough to know Shaq has not only does he can reach people, but he has credibility. His brand actually has credibility in our communities 
totally different than just being able to reach them, but to actually to have someone actually think they can accept and they believe they can engage. Yeah, so I love and, and, a, and a big shout out to Nimbus, Stacey Wade, uh, CEO, his wife, um, uh, Chief Transformation Officer, Dr. Dawn Wade, who was a, uh, a student of mine, uh, and when she's getting her PhD, um, I, I came and taught a class, and, and she reached out to me to say, hey, this you, this is this DNI thing is your thing, but but in terms of credibility in the black community, um, particularly in Louisville, Kentucky, Atlanta, and even nationally, um, again, um, I, and I'm I'm constantly looking to leverage them for future clients. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So I, you have such an interesting background. Where do you think this industry is going, right? So some would say this DNI stuff is like a flash in the pan, like it's just going to go away three years from now. George Floyd gets killed. Brianna gets killed. You know, so right now people are paying attention. Once COVID's over, world gets back to what it is. People are not going to stop caring about this DNI stuff, this DNI work. It really won't. It's not a long journey, a longevity plan if you're building a model around that. What do you say to that? I say, though, I say... Um, it, it would be, I know my wife is going to be mad if I said that, you know, I wish that we advanced as a, as I wish that companies and communities in the country advanced to the point we didn't need an Icarus consulting, but we are not there. We are, we are not there. We are, we are so, there's so much work to be done um, that I believe companies and, and, com and, and communities uh, in the country will always need the, the services of someone like a an Icarus um, consulting and and Henry, I say that because I got into this work back in the day when lawsuits were being dropped every mm -hmm. other week and companies were having to respond to lawsuits of um, unfair treatment, um, discrimination, primarily uh, racial, and then it evolved. Then it went to gender, um, and then it went to age. And then it went to, uh, uh, you know, LGBTQ plus. Um, unfortunately, companies will always need coaching and consulting on how to on, on how as the diversity of your company increases. How do you make that a work in a place where everybody every day feels um, respected, not regardless of their gender? Or orientation or race, but because of it, mm. oh, because you know your your race brings a unique perspective to the to our workforce that we could that we need. Um, we, you should and then value for your competencies and skill sets. You hire me for a reason, guys. But you know you, you got to respect game. <laughs> you, right, know, right, you know right. what I'm saying? You know it's like guys, you got to respect the game, and then just treat me with dignity. Gosh, as a human being, God created me. You didn't create me. So therefore, who are you to not treat me with dignity? It's not that complicated. But, but companies do not put forth the intentional efforts they need. Or sometimes they simply don't know how to do it. And so they will always, um, unfortunately, um, need the, the services of an Icarus Consulting and a, a Dr. Shelton Good and my wife, who loves shoes and purses. <laughs> honey, you go get that money. <laughs> she, says, she says, hey, don't get behind in invoices because I've already got my eyes on a, on another pair of shoes and a matching purse. So it's, it's, it, my, I met my wife in a diversity certification program. Oh, it was a okay. eight-week program. Uh, she went through the program as a diversity executive um, she later came back and became the president and CEO of the American Institute for Managing Diversity, who had who had a program called the Diversity Leadership Academy. Eight weeks, you became a certified as a diversity um, professional and practitioner. That's where I met her. So she knows the work I do, and uh, she, you know she's um, she since left corporate and, and and started her own business. But she say, um, my money is for me. Your money is to take care of us. So, you know, you get out there and, and get that. You, you got to go out get there and paper. get that money. Right? So. She said, get that. She said, you got to get that bag, hubby. Yeah, you got yeah, that. You got yeah. that. I, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> it's the truth, man. I'm not making that up. <laughs> I, I, I believe you. I believe you. You know, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that 
you have such a, a perspective on what's going on in the industry. But what you also have done is you're an author, right? So you wrote, you're writing books. I know you have another book that's coming up. Is that part of a, a, a strategy? Is that intentional of writing books? Like, you know, so a lot of people write books as a marketing tool. I want to write a book. I'm going to use this book to go around and speak about the book. I'm going to sign some books. I reckon I might not make a lot of money off the book, but the book is a tool for me to get in front of people, get my content in front of them. Hope I get speaking engagements. And that's what I use. When I go around, hey, if you want my book, recognize the book's not going to make me wealthy and within the book within itself, but it's a marketing tool to help me build my brand, expect my brand and my content. Is is that, was that and, what and, you were thinking? And And that is a very effective model. And it's one that it has worked for me. So let me be very transparent. But you also have to remember, I'm a what's called the pracademic. Mm-hmm. I'm a practitioner, but I also teach. So I've taught for Georgia Military College. I've taught for um, uh, I taught for Troy University. I've taught uh, classes for Georgia State. Um, I've taught. Um, I'm on the adjunct faculty for Duke University. So so I'm also an academic. Remember, in academics, you got to publish. Oh, okay. And so, so you, in order to have credibility, if you're going to consider yourself a thought leader, people are going to say, "Okay, when's the last time you shared any of your thoughts?" And let's be clear: a thought leader has to put their thoughts out, whether they're accepted, not accepted, popular, not a popular. You have to be pre- you have to be prepared to put your thoughts out there, and then be able to support them, defend them, or clarify them, or amplify them. And so, so you can't call yourself a, a, a thought leader and not publish. You can't call yourself uh, an academic and not and not publish. I mean, so, and, and then last but not least, the brother got a lot of things in his head. That for me, it's cathartically, it helps me get them out of my head onto paper. Um, I told you I was very uh, profoundly impacted by the deaths of, um, you know, Tamir Rice and, and, and Trayvon and others. And it's like, you know, I, People just think, oh, they, 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 that was their fault. They had to have a reason. They didn't. They didn't comply with the police. I, I, I did my research, which, which included interviewing um, over 150 senior law enforcement officials, and say, help me understand your perspective. That was very controversial to put that in a book that's talking about the killing of black men to even offer what that what the other perspective is. But that's part of the problem. You, we got We got you. There's always, always multiple sides to any story. Mm-hmm. Winter in America on November 9th, 2016. I'm just going to be very transparent. I was disappointed in this country in electing a unqualified person for president. And, and I mean that everything that as a black man, I've been told, oh, you, you know, you, you want us to give you affirmative action. You know, you want special things because you're black. You know, you want unearned um, benefits. You know, you, you got to be qualified. Opportunity should go to the most qualified. OK, fine. Only thing I've ever asked for this country was stick by your rules. If it's going to be one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible for liberty and justice for all, then, then, then you should be able to point to me and say this is the case. If you say we're, we're going to uh, le- we're going to hire somebody to be the chief administrator and, and the commander in chief over the military, you should select the most qualified. You had 16 candidates to put up to represent your party. You put up the least qualified, and then America doubled down on that by then electing that person in a in a in a in a, in a, in a national election. To, to me, that doesn't make any sense. That's for, you know, 60 million people had it was on an interview panel, and and so I was profoundly disappointed. The only way I could explain it in a and articulate it in a way that I hope people would understand is say. Here is what happened. Here's what the turnout was. And here's what I predict will be the result of making what I believe to be in 2016 a bad decision. And I think that I think that the evidence will strongly back me up now that that was a bad decision. That we made. You know, don't you think, though, that President Trump, uh, I'm just going to say, his name, that's what you're talking about, is. What well, do you think his election was also a response to having a black president and having a President Obama in there, and that those who didn't like President Obama being there, that was the that was the the United States way of trying to balancing out what somebody perceived as not being a good thing on their own. 
Uh, you know, I, and President Trump really, and I, people don't like when I say this, but it's true. He's, he's like, traditionally, when we were growing up, you and I, when people talk about the American dream, Shelton, they talked about you have to be rich. You don't want to be politically correct. You know, you want to do what's right. You want to fight the fight. Like you want to be basically John Wayne, right? Like you want to be John Wayne. He fits all these checks, those boxes for a lot of America. They, he's what they see as the American dream. And they saw President Barack Obama maybe not as that American dream. So I, I think, I think it was just a response to President Obama. I mean, I, I, I think he just was John Wayne coming and say, I'm going to take, I'm going to make our country great again. I'm going to take it back from these black folk. <laughs> and, and, and that's, and that's why I wrote Winter in America. I had my own perceptions and feelings and beliefs but winter in america is research based so mm. the first two chapters talks about what actually happened what mm. was voter turnout and 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 not giving too much away but let i can tell you what shelton good thinks but i can tell you today what actually happened mm. and had you had had you had the certain the same turnout in 12 that you yeah. had in 16. I'm not talking about 08. I'm talking about 12. No, let me scratch that. If you had the same turnout that you had in 2004, even though Bush won, you would have you would have had a different result in 2016. Voter turnout in traditionally taken for granted precincts. Okay. Now, now so, so I, don't, a, I don't want to go there, but that's well, no, why we're about I to have wrote, a conversation. Though we're about to have a conversation. That's though. why I wrote Winter in America. Now, I have to read. I have to read this book. I have to yeah. read this. So let's talk about the facts first, and then we can talk about the implications. But I want to be sure that people understand how national political elections are run mm-hmm. and won. Yeah, I, and won. As someone who's, uh, you know, a recovering politician, want to be a politician, I, I get that. And I know I, you do. I, I, I know you do. So I would actually, and I agree with you. I would blame. I put someone that blame in the Democratic Party, though. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not placing blame. Yeah, I, yeah. But, but I, I will. I, okay. I will okay. say that I think the Democratic Party sometimes takes for granted that their base, and they recognize it now. You, you need black folk to turn out in numbers yes. for you to win. Hands down. That's it. There's like this bottom line. You can try, make it more complex. You uh-huh. want it. Uh, you not, say whatever. You need data. It goes back to what you said, evidence based. The data, the numbers show when black people turn out. Yes. Democrats went and the Republicans know that now. Yes, they know if we, if we get 12 Republicans, if we get 12 percent, 13 percent and the black folks to vote, we win. Right. So I kind of think that that's you know that. oh, you yeah. Know that. oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yes. and what I'm saying is, Henry, let's call it. Let's let's be real candid here. Not a lot of people understand. Mm. I have gone out to a college or universities when I did went to America. I was called out by several public administration and public political scientist colleagues that says, would you come and talk to my class? I've had, I was in a class where I said some statements that were factual. A, a student, a doctoral student stood up to me and challenged them. And then I says, okay, I respect that you disagree, but please go do your own research. And then I did something to this day that I'm not sure I'm really proud of, but it made my point. I says, I says, oh, by the way, did you vote in the 16 election? He said, no. And, and so you see my point, people don't understand the thing, some of the things we understand. So, but again, I don't want to, my, I needed to get out of my soul, the pain that I felt with, with that, with that much more so than the, than, than back-to-back elections of, uh, of, of, of W. Um, this one to me was speaking something different to the, the soul of, uh, of America. It was clear to me. Something changed between 08 and six and 16. And now we clearly know in 20 that 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 direction, that tilt that we saw in 16, we saw what happened um, again. More people voted in any other election. Um, and so we, let's just end that there. So and we yeah. saw what and we saw what happened when the result went a different way. These are facts. This is not Shelton Good. I'm just telling people. Uh, look, he's. I, I'll back you up. This is factual. And again, 
if Democrats, if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican or whatever, that's not my thing. Let me, let me say one more quick thing. I'm here in Atlanta. OK. And I did some I got got did some get out the vote and did some things this last election. So look at Georgia. Yeah. You see the results of turnout. Uh, oh, 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 um, first time, you know, person that lost a congressional race wins a Senate race. He just so happens to be young, just so happens to be white, just so happens to be Jewish. You have a, you have a first time candidate who, who happens to be black, happens to be male, happens to be a pastor of the church. Those two guys shouldn't have won, but turn out. And then all, what do you get as the re immediate response to that? The immediate response. Not we, we're not even going to talk about what, what, what the governor did to disenfranchise voters to win the gubernatorial race. But what do you see as the direct response? So, folks, what I'm trying to do is, look, don't don't challenge my positions. Go out, do your own research, enlighten yourself and and, and be prepared for the 22 uh, elections and, and the 24. That's all I'm saying. So I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. These things have profound impacts on my business. Um, elections, social justice, the the the, the uh, not treating people with dignity and respect, and I'm talking for whatever reason. Uh, we're seeing, and you saw it, stop the, the stop Asian. Come on, man! There had already been almost four thousand incidents prior to the one in Atlanta. You see, we needed to stop that after the first six or seven. Four thousand later, you have the incidents. You see, what I'm saying. People have got to understand it's going to take direct action to arrest the direction we're going in, which is not the right direction. It's not it's not healthy. It is simply not healthy. In fact, it's dangerous. That's a whole different conversation where the country is going uh, and hopefully that it will get better. Right. So hopefully that's the that's the my hope and my faith. Is helping to try to be optimistic and hopeful that things will change, Agreed. but I, do, I but I do I do see what you're saying. I do think we're in a challenging time, and we can go either way right now. And this political battle you're talking about is not going to change in the next four to eight to twelve years. Uh, so for me, out of everything we just said, like you said, make it simple. I'll make it simple. You need to win. You need black folk to turn out to win. Simple, Absolutely. which also means black folks. I'll speak to, speak to my people right now, black folks. Don't let anyone take you for granted, though. So don't let just people come, people come around, just come to the churches, come around when it's election time. Make the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, whatever it is, make sure that they give you something for your votes. Make sure that they, and if they say they're going to do it, they stick by it. Don't let them take us for granted. And they, both sides do that. And so don't let them take it for granted. Make them, if they need us, great. That's a democratic society we live in. That is great. But make sure that they earn your vote. Don't just give it up. Agreed. Just don't I give it up. Couldn't agree with you more. Could um, not agree with you more. Okay, so before we go, you, I know. You, tell me about your new book. You have a new book coming out. What's what's that? What's that about? I'm gonna get there, but I gotta get the winner in America now. Like you got yeah. me sold well, on that. Well, what's the well, new book? So crisis, crisis in winter in America was kind of backward looking. Think what happened and me trying to um, enlighten myself as well as others about what had happened in the past. I'm really excited about my next book. I'm entitled Beyond Inclusion, Reimagining the Future of Work, Workers in the Workplace. I'm really excited about this because it's future looking and, and it allows me to go around and tell um, you know, corporate CEOs and senior leaders and and uh, and and chairmen of boards. Hey, this if you've ever wanted to do something, this is the time to dust off all those plays. We can't do this because of this. We can't do this because of this. We can't. this is the time to not only go back and pull those things out, but to really um, reimagine how we're going to get work done, how you're going to make money, how you're going to become sustainable. Looking into the future, I, I, I love. I'm a, you know, I grew up being a Trekkie, right? And you know, I remember, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Captain Kirk flipping out his communicator. I mean, you know, that was the '60s, and now, you know, remember flip. Remember now, even now, flip phones are not yeah. a thing of the future. They're actually ancient history, right? Um, so, imagining the future, man, I, I'm excited about. So, I talk about in the book how you can come on, come out 
on the other side of these multiple pandemics, multiple pandemics, COVID, the social justice, uh, social injustice, um, injustice, and then the political divide, how you can come out as a corporation, as an organization, and, and thrive and be successful by being bold. I have a client that you told me before COVID, we can't send customer service reps home. We have to keep them in this customer care center. Yeah. And and and, and now they decided to keep all of 100% of their customer service reps at home, working from home for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me what you can't. So th that was driven by a crisis. What I'm asking people now to use those crises as a platform for the future and reimagine. This is the time to go to your shareholders and, and say, look, we're going to withhold a couple of dividend payments, but here's what we're going to do. And, we, and we're going to make it up to you later. Because this is the time for, you know, employees to go to their manager and say, hey, you know, in order for me to do my best work, in addition being to being treated with dignity and respect, I, I think I could be more effective if maybe I came in two days a week, maybe work from home and, and travel a little less. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that I'm really so that's what the book talks about. It's got actual case studies, actual interviews where I ask um, both CEOs, HR leaders, um, if you could be, I asked one HR leader, if you could just be king for a day be chairman of the board CEO, and you can snap your fingers and make one change, what would it be? And I capture that interview in the book. So thank you for allowing me the time to think about it. Let me again, um, thank you for this uh, platform, which allows authentic and unfiltered voices. And thank you for your sponsors for trusting, you know, for investing and, in, you know, and supporting you. Um, I think platforms like this, more so than network television is the way of the future for communicating. Yeah. I really do believe that. So I'm proud of you, brother. Keep it up. Thank you. And, you know, it's uh, we're in niche. So we've grown fast. We're number one. Like we reached about 1.5 million people a month. So like we're, we're growing. So thank you for that. Uh, where can people get your books, though, brother? Is this Amazon or where do they get them? Um, yeah. So any they're on, uh, any um, retail um, bookseller, you know, um, uh, if, and also if you, you know, connect with me on uh, on LinkedIn, um, I may be able to give you a hookup. I, I was, I, look, I need this. I was about to say, I need an autograph. So I need an it's autograph. Coming. It's coming. It's coming. I, it's I coming. Need a, I need to win in America. You got me so to win in America because we're, we're speaking the same language on that. So I want to see that. And, and let's, let's come back and talk about that. Let's come back and you and me. Um, let's consider it a, 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 a political science one on one. And let's walk people through your days of being yeah. in politics. And, and, yeah. and, and, and I've got some questions for you being. So my PhD is in political science with an emphasis on public administration. So yeah. we can have a whole conversation about what needs to happen differently. Not only just individual voter behavior, but me, you ask me, a two-party system for the country to really, really advance to being what it needs to be. Um, I think the two, and I know, I know what you're thinking, but I still believe the solution is something other than a two-party system. I, that might be the case. Like I, that might be totally the case. I, I do think that the two party system, it depends what angle you're coming from. But for just from a person of color perspective, they do take people of color for granted. Yep. And I, and I, and I get in trouble for saying this. I think it's just for people of color, I think either we need to play in both parties, influence both parties, or we all need to be independent and make all parties come and give us, like, come to us so we can get some for our votes. I don't think that they, I don't think one party should have all our votes. I don't, I don't think that's strategic. I don't think that helps us. I think they either have to earn it. We, we're independent. We're playing on both sides, influence on the same, or like you said, maybe different parties. But how it's working right now, it just doesn't work for the best interests of the people. That's agree. Agree. That's, that's a you know that's a whole different conversation. Now, but about. but you but you being a political uh, you know retired recovering political person, you know we've been we've been trying to get the Republican party to understand and open it, make the tent bigger. You got to have issues. And, and of course, they, 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 it's a chicken versus the egg. Which one comes is going to come first? Mm -hmm. Are they going to have some planks that we can buy into? Or are they going to say, no, you come into the party and, and enough in a critical mass and maybe you can influence the planks? Right now, I will That's tell a great you. Great question. Great um, question. 
Great question. You know, so so please let's let's put that on the radar for some future show. Great question. Like ooh, I was like, see, I want to dig into that now. Like a great question. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, and if the Republican Party was smart, they would I, they would they would open up their platform for people of color. I mean, look, people of color, we want to be entrepreneurial. We're definitely, I mean, at the core, we're capitalists. Like, listen, any rapper, Jay Z, Ross, Drake, they all talking about building capital. They all want to build wealthy. Right. We all want we want good education. We want safe streets. Right. Like at the core, or at least what the Republican Party claim or used to claim to be, because there's something else now, but they used to claim to be that should be a, that should be easy for them to connect to people of color. We're, we're faith based. I, I, I just I don't get yeah. them. I don't get them at all. I don't like strategically what they're doing. Demographics are shifting. I just don't get them at all. Like I don't. Yeah. Well, I see no strategy around it at all. Well, but. they're they're unrecognizable from the the Reagan the the party of Reagan. Totally unrecognizable. But again, topic for another discussion. And yeah. if, 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 if and, 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 and and if you want to, you know, you bring your squad, you bring all your people, and and and, and, and we will we'll 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 go we'll we'll play we'll play some some two on two, and we'll see we'll see what's up. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I guarantee we'll do that. We'll bring that back. I know, okay. Because I know people want to hear the conversation, right? And yeah, I know I, they do. And I, know I really do. want to hear the conversation. Okay. So before we go, we'll ask question. Ask everyone. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, if I, I think um, that's an easy question. If you ask anybody that know me, they would say Shelton's brand is he's he's a mentor, he's a coach. I've, I've had people reach out to me, strangers on LinkedIn. I have. Can you help me this? Can you? So I'm that person who understands that I'm here. I'm a product of grace and mercy, and I really should say mercy and grace. You know, I was able to survive the streets. Um, and but I, it came late, it, I, later in life. It dawned on me all the gifts, everything that's been given to you, wasn't wasn't for you. You know, some of this stuff is for other people. Once I figured that out, and I started really being intentional about helping people, and it can't help everybody. And you certainly can help them and give them everything, but certainly you can do something. Um, that's my brand is superpower is helping people. I mentioned Don Wade earlier. You know. Um, uh, being an instructor in the classroom and, and then her remembering, wow, you know, there was something you said, and I'm going to reach back out to you so you can partner with us to help this company. Um, and, and I've got so many former students and, and people will just tell you that's his brand. He's, he's probably generous to a fault with his time and energy, just trying to help, just trying to, you know, we have this saying in the black community, each one, reach one, each one, teach one. We got, you know, come on, man. That's how we grew up. So, that's I just try to make minds real because I know I did not get here, but for the the grace and mercy of God. So, uh, you know, when my time is up and he's saying, "Okay, let me look at your book," you're like, "Oh yeah, you good? Yeah, your credit's good. Come on, you know, come on." <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm gonna need some of that grace, considering right. some of the some of the things I'm, I messed up on. <laughs> I, right? I, I say all the time when I get when I get to heaven, if I get to heaven, all I want to say is I love. Like, hope is that enough? Like, I love. <laughs> 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 so thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Thank you, man, we, for the we, opportunity. We appreciate you so much and all the wisdom that you, you gave us today and all the gems. Oh, uh, cool. we, we'll see you next week at our leadership summit April 14th and 15th. Uh, you want more wisdom? Come check Y'all check, this, check that out. Y'all check that out. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of powerful uh, men like him on there. We thank you for that. And hopefully uh, you go check him out, his books. His website, like he is a man of knowledge and wisdom, as you heard. If you want this, uh, more content, make sure you go to our podcast page, go to our YouTube page. Thank you again. Thank you for Shelton Good. We thank you, brother. And we will see you next time on Real Talk. This is... 365 Media.